get going. Hopefully. Looks great. All right. Does that look good from your point of view? Okay. It does. Okay, wonderful. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Melissa Keenan. I'm the head of research at La Jolla Labs, and uh, I'm grateful for the invitation to talk today and introduce our company to all of you. Uh, the title of my talk is Platform Process and Pipeline at La Jolla Labs, Redefining the RNA Targeting Therapeutics Discovery. So uh, an outline today, I'll begin with a background on La Jolla Labs and uh, kind of who we are and how long we've been around. And then I'll turn to a more detailed description of our discovery platform. I like to think of these as our tools for drug discovery. And then I'll finish up with an example of how we design ASOs. So first a little bit on who La Jolla Labs is. Uh, by way of introduction, La Jolla Labs is an, an R, is an RNA therapeutics company with a proprietary discovery platform. In particular, we're interested in neurological indications. Uh, we have an experienced leadership team uh, that are really fun to work with. In, in uh, particular, I'd like to highlight Jeff. He's our CEO, and he sends his regrets from a plane somewhere between San Diego and Basel. Um, but he has years of experience in the bioinformatics field and drug discovery and um, development, initially at Genentech and then at Ionis Pharmaceuticals and then at Arcturus uh, before he left to, um, to form La Jolla Labs. Uh, our scientific advisory board is also a, a highly experienced team with uh, expertise in data science and drug development. And here I'd like to highlight Tamar Grossman. She's also a co-founder of La Jolla Labs. Uh, she has lots of experience in drug discovery and development. Um, she's currently the VP and global head of RNA at gene therapy and delivery at J&J. &J. So if you haven't had the pleasure of uh, learning about us or hearing about us yet, it may be because we haven't been around for too long. Uh, La Jolla Labs was founded in November of 2021, so just about two years ago. Uh, we feel like we've made a lot of headway and important steps over those two years and are really poised to make a long-term impact, um, which I'll talk about a little bit next. Um, but from our uh, initial partnerships with N. Lorem, who's um, a leader in the U.S. in the N of One space, um, to launching our rare disease blog and opening a new lab and uh, really getting our screens going um, this year. Over this process, we've uh, collated over 10 collaborations and clients in the rare disease space, and we really hope to foster these relationships as we continue uh, to make an impact uh, in the rare disease space. And really the, the big goal that La Jolla Labs is striving to achieve is to democratize the drug discovery process. So make it more accessible to everyone. Um, and we feel like our partners with both influential and new groups in the rare disease space, some of whom are highlighted here, uh, are really key players to this big goal of ours. But internally, how are we doing this? Um, La Jolla Labs is democratizing drug discovery um, and first by creating uh, designs for therapeutics and proposals for screening those potential uh, therapeutic compounds without an upfront cost. So we will look at look at a particular target or variant um, and really try to understand it without charging any initial fees. We also guarantee that all of the screen compounds and the intellectual property or IP within those screens and those compounds are client held. So we have no interest in uh, slowing down the drug development process <clears throat> by holding on to any IP. Similarly, we refuse to partake in what Jeff so nicely calls patent squatting. So um, if we have patents and we have a few, we're actively um, moving those tools and ideas um, into the development, drug development and discovery process. And this, I don't have the liberty to tell you a whole lot about today, but keep your eyes and ears open because the, the final part we'd like to really incorporate over the next, um, start get starting, starting over the next few months is we'd like to create a real time uh, clinical neurosurveillance program to understand both the acute toxicity, neurotoxicity and the longevity um, 
longitudinal uh, toxicity of ASOs that are intrathecally delivered using clinical data. So this is um, a new direction for the company, and I'm sure Jeff will have opportunities to tell you all more about it in the future, but we're really excited about that. Um, so together, we feel like these internal steps, as well as um, how we interact with uh, our groups and relationships in this rare disease space, will really hope to drive the N of one and of rare space forward um, efficiently, safely, and together. So next, I'd like to turn to our discovery platform. Again, these are the tools that we use to identify potential therapeutic compounds, but um, I'd like to take a sidestep first to introduce the antisense oligonucleotides. Uh, Scott gave a really great introduction, so this makes my job easy. But um, just to, for completeness sake, uh, antisense oligonucleotides, or ASOs, are a class of drug, uh, um, drug therapeutics. They target the RNA. And as he described, they're really at the, at the center core is the nucleotide um, with a base, ATGC, your DNA sorts of bases. Um, and they have a number of modifications that Scott nicely talked about, both at the sugar, the two prime carbon on the sugar, as well as um, the backbone. And these modifications, um, some of which are described here, uh, greatly improve the pharmacodynamic properties and stability of these um, molecules. Seen another way, they're just a, a, a string of bases together that hybridize through Watson-Crick uh, base pairing rules to their target, which is an RNA molecule. This elicits changes in gene expression. And what I'd like to highlight a little different from Scott's um, presentation is that in addition to the GATMER design that he talked very nicely about uh, to downregulate a target, you can also use these chemistry changes to have occupancy only, or I like to call them steric blocking molecules. So basically these little molecules are just getting in the way of different biological processes. And depending how you design them, they can either upregulate or downregulate their target. And I'll talk a little bit more at the end of an example of upregulation. So these are the platform that we like the best and is really our focus at La Jolla Labs. And so our proprietary RNA targeting drug discovery platform, I really like to think of in three pieces. So a platform um, that is rooted in these machine learning or AI enabled RNA targeting tools, um, including LJ Splice and TSET, which I won't talk as much about today, but I'll highlight LJ Splice in a second. And we take these tools, these bioinformatic tools, and they feed into our process. So our process, uh, we like to think of as a highly efficient um, mode of discovery for RNA targeting therapeutics. Um, this is led by our HTS Bio software, which I'll walk you through again at the end, but this is our design tool. Basically, um, we use it to design ASOs. And then uh, we also have an in vitro screening laboratory that I'll mention again in a second. But these uh, together, our platform and our process have allowed us uh, to develop a, a pipeline that is both externally partnered and um, internally driven. So I'd like to highlight a few things on that last slide next uh, in terms of our tools. And the first is HTS.bio. And this is software that Jeff wrote largely. Um, and he, we really describe it as the industry leading software for RNA drug discovery. These are just screenshots of what it'll look like. And again, I'll uh, go through it a, a little bit more um, at the end, but we, we view it as the most comprehensive software platform for designing uh, RNA targeting therapeutics, including mostly ASOs. And uh, through this software, you can easily interrogate your gene of interest. You can overlay many different um, RNA-seq experiments. So understanding the expression of uh, an RNA and down to the individual exons. Uh, and you can bookmark and label features of interest, come back to it, build off it. Um, and view our proprietary splicing attributes. So these are our splicing models, which I'll talk about in a second, um, on any uh, human exon, um, any mRNA in a human exon, any exon in a human mRNA. And this program also permits you to design ASOs of varying length, chemistry, placement, and um, shifting um, in terms of design, location. And finally, to 
simplify the process, you can export directly to IDT order form. Uh, and this is a, a major company used for synthesis of these molecules. We hope that this streamlines the process um, from discovery towards synthesis and screening. The second tool I'd like to highlight is LJ Splice. This is an AI tool that predicts RNA splicing. So the output of it is kind of visualized down here in the white box. Um, it's built on RNA-seq data and tries to predict the sequences around particular exons that either promote exon inclusion, which would be reflected with these upward bars um, or stretched out letters here, um, or those sequences that are predicted to promote exon exclusion. And so by using our serif blocking ASOs, you can place them over these regions predicted either to include or exclude, depending on how you want to affect the biology. Uh, the true impact of LJ Splice is we feel it um, significantly reduces the number of compounds needed to screen to find um, ones to take further through development. Um, by Jeff's calculations, uh, he thinks that only you need to screen about 150 compounds um, in the case of Spinrazas, and it, this is the SMA drug that is also an, um, a seric blocking ASO compound, um, and compared to the original screen, which is um, shown up above in blue, which had I think nearly 500 ASOs. So this drastically reduces the time and costs needed for these large screening experiments. And the last thing I'd like to highlight in terms of our process and our platform is our, um, our laboratory, our wet lab. Uh, it's a high throughput screening lab that allows for rapid turnaround of dose responsive leads. Um, and we have a lot of fun. As you can see, Jacob is having great fun in this cell culture hood. But um, we, we do a standard bio, um, molecular biology techniques, but also including IPSC reprogramming, transfection optimization, screening assay design, and transcriptomics analyses. And as I mentioned before, we really feel like this process and platform have allowed us to develop a, a pipeline. And this includes both a series of software and AI models, um, some of which are in production and development that you can go and use uh, today if you so desired, and some are still um, coming still. And there's also a series of therapeutics and targets, both in the oncology as well as the rare disease space that are at various stages of um, preclinical development. So as any good startup, uh, we have our sights set on what's next, how to get better and um, over time. So right now, we really have this design process down internally, as well as our, our screening and our wet lab. But we'd like to include, um, hopefully, a synthesis lab to then have this whole process under one roof uh, within La Jolla Labs. We think this will really innovate and improve um, the efficiency of this RNA targeting therapeutics discovery space. Okay, and then I'm going a little quick here, but let's talk through uh, an example of ASO design using our tools. So how does it work when a group comes to La Jolla Labs? This is a situation we have almost on a weekly basis, really, that uh, a rare disease parent group approaches La Jolla Labs uh, and it was basically wondering, can an ASO strategy work for me? Maybe they're really familiar with ASOs, maybe they're not. Um, it doesn't matter. Uh, we're happy to walk through all the various um, different approaches um, and really start to shed light on um, the answer to this question. So uh, kind of a, a process for you all to orient. Uh, from an initial contact, we perform something that's called a, a target review. That's what we call it internally. Um, for this, we're trying to understand all the relevant biology as well as the drug development space um, relevant to a particular disease or variant. So, <clears throat> Um, everything from the mRNA structure to the IP landscape and what's already out there for this disease. And we do this so that we're as well informed as we can be, uh, being non-experts going into a rare disease space, a new rare disease. Um, and then from there, if the client so desires, partner desires, we create a strategy design and proposal, including a budget for performing these initial wet lab experiments. Um, if everyone decides to execute on that, uh, we finish up our ASO design and run it through our off-target reports and filter for um, some properties of ASOs that make them less desirable as therapeutics. 
Uh, right now, we then send off this list of ASOs for external synthesis. But like I said, hopefully we could do it in-house one day. And then they come back to us and we perform first a primary screen. So this is just a, a screen of all the compounds that we've designed for this strategy um, in a, hopefully a, cell, a, a relevant cell model. And we're willing to work with any group to understand what the best cell model is. And then from there, we take our leads um, into a dose response screen. And really, um, it gives us a lot more confidence when ASOs have a dose responsive effect um, on their target. And then, of course, we provide the results. Um, and so turning back to our antisense oligonucleotides and how um, through different chemistries, they can alter gene expression differently. I wanted to take a different approach um, from what Scott highlighted in terms of knockdown to really see if we can, um, for this hypothetical example, if, if and how we can upregulate um, a target with ASOs. So how can ASOs upregulate gene expression? Um, this I think is a pretty cool, cool concept and really you can get creative in understanding the biology um, and thinking about how you can use these as tools to have a therapeutic effect. But this review from Stan Crook nicely um, highlights a few of the more commonly considered ways um, you can use them to uh, interact with UORFs or tie elements to affect the translation of an mRNA. You can also use them to inhibit negative regulatory pathways, such as uh, the microRNAs or nonsense mediated decay. And so these, again, they're steric blocking ASOs, so they can kind of get in the way of these processes and stop them. Um, but what I'd like to highlight going forward here is really the, the splicing modulation, because this is where La Jolla Labs likes to focus. Even within splicing modulation, there's different mechanisms we consider. So one is exon skipping. This is a, a pretty commonly considered um, mechanism where basically you're altering the inclusion of different exons in the final mRNA. <clears throat> Additionally, we can alter the isoform ratio or abundances. So depending on some transcripts, actually different isoforms are more important or drive different biology. And um, there's potential uh, space for ASOs to alter those isoforms and push the biology in different directions. Um, and then also uh, steric blocking ASOs can be used to exclude or include, depending if you want to upregulate or downregulate um, your target, uh, decoy or poison exons. So these would be exons that are not a part of the canonical mRNA transcript. Um, so for today, I thought we could uh, highlight maybe a potential um, exon skipping strategy in a hypothetical situation. So um, I thought we could talk about uh, galactosemia. So I have a personal connection to this rare disease, so I know very little about it. I should know more, but um, really that galactosemia is a life-threatening disease of inborn galactose metabolism error. Um, its incidence is about 50,000 people in the U.S., and um, it's known that mutations in this GALT enzyme cause disease. Uh, nearly 70% of the mutations are this one, uh, this one mutation that has an A to G change in the cDNA that causes the glutamine to arginine change in the protein. This causes the most severe form um, <clears throat> of galactosemia, and it's a classic pathogenic variant. And then if we start to consider the biology of this variant in a little more detail, uh, we know that it occurs in exon six, and as I'll describe in a minute, um, so qualities of different exons make them more or less amenable, um, potentially, uh, for exon skipping with steric blocking ASOs. And so for exon six in, in the GALT transcript, it both starts and ends in frame zero. This means that we would call this an in-frame exon. So if you were to cut it out, um, it would kind of just be like skipping over a piece of the mRNA, but the rest of the mRNA could continue to be read. Um, this exon is 57 base pairs long and so encodes 19 amino acids, which is a fairly short exon, which is also um, more preferable for this exon skipping strategy. So we asked the question, can we use ASOs to restore a normal enough expression of GALT by skipping exon six? And this is uh, kind of shown in this figure here, but I thought a visual would be nice. Um, so in this um, description, they're talking about uh, a variant here 
by the red X that affects um, splicing and it, it changes the, the reading frame of this particular mRNA and no protein is expressed. That's not quite the case we have here. We have a, a missense mutation that doesn't affect the reading frame, um, but in the end, you're still having a non-functional protein that's causing disease. But what I like about uh, this figure is it's showing how the ASO can really get in the way here. And you can show that um, you're skipping out this exon with the mutation. And what you get in the end is an mRNA that gets translated and you get a partially um, a truncated. So it's a little bit smaller. In this case, it's missing a piece in the middle of the protein. But um, if it's functional enough, then it can restore some of that lost function um, that's causing disease. And I do want to mention that that's a, a really critical piece. And it can be um, challenging is understanding the protein level effects of any uh, RNA targeting ASO um, and understanding if, how is the protein changed in the end? Um, is it still functional? Is it functional enough? Is it, unfortunately, would it be causing um, a negative protein, like a dominant negative sort of effect? Um, and these are, are can be really challenging questions to understand um, and often require building in vitro models in the lab setting. Um, but if we use our software now to see if we can design these ASOs um, to skip exon six. So I'd just like to show you what that would look like if you could do that, to, if you wanted to go do that today, um, which you can do, you can register for HCS bio, make a login, and then um, the whole software is available now. So when you begin to answer this sort of question, you load a, a transcript into the software. You can see, here's my cursor, um, the little green arrow here is where the mRNA starts. Um, it gets translated in this direction to the stop highlighted by a red. Uh, the dark blue are the exons and then the light blue lines between are the introns. Um, <clears throat> I really like it because you can load multiple um, transcript IDs. So in this case, Galt actually has multiple transcript IDs, and then you can align them so that here it's very easy to see that this alternative um, isoform is missing two exons kind of at the start of the transcript. Um, but today we're going to focus on exon six, as I mentioned, which is right here in the red box. And so from there, you can zoom in really close if you want uh, to the transcript and um, to the point where you start to see the sequence. And you can see that the dark blue bar is maintained to show you where the exon starts and oh, stops. Um, those bookmarks that I mentioned earlier, I think I've put in the SNP variant that um, causes this mutation of interest we're looking at in exon six. It's this last A in the exon. And then what I've also done here is loaded our, um, the, our LJ Splice uh, AI tool to understand what sequences uh, are contributing to exon inclusion and exclusion. So again, the bars upwards highlight the sequences that are predicted to promote exon inclusion. And those below are um, those predicted to promote exon exclusion. And so um, you can also, like I mentioned, overlay the RNA-seq. Um, in our software, they appear as these green sort of layers to the tracks. And you can, um, you can, it'll load it for the whole transcript. And so you can see very, if there's clean exons, or in this case, it kind of bleeds um, at the five prime end of this exon. But you can use this in, from a number of different tissues. We have it available now um, to understand tissue difference um, an expression or uh, just general expression patterns of an mRNA. Um, and then if we really zoom in and then we start designing our oligos, this is what it can look like. So um, first you select a chemistry. So I've chosen the 18 or full mo. So this is um, like we talked about at my talk and Scott's, it does not include the gap. It has a um, the same modifications on all the, the bases here. Um, and then I just went in and I said add oligos and you click on a certain space that you feel like might be relevant to the question you're asking and hit tile. And so I tiled over this region here and here. I put one extra oligo over this space. Um, and these are all based on following the LJ splice uh, 
predictive model and it generates the ASO sequence. And it, uh, the default is a three nucleotide shift across the region uh, where you click. And you can always go back and put more in and have them be, for example, a one nucleotide shift. Um, and then from there, what you can do, so this in this here, I have 41 oligos over this particular space. So you imagine if you um, increase or decrease the, the shift length, you could easily increase that number of ASOs um, and really, in our experience, it comes down to a balance of, of budget, um, which is largely in this situation currently driven by um, the synthesis cost of these molecules um, and, and um, your project goals. And so from here, like I said, you can export these oligos um, in a format compatible with an IDT order form. And then um, if you wanted us to do it or you do it in your own um, space, that's completely up to you uh, to understand um, the screening. So the RNA level effects of these oligos. And then of course there you would also uh, further downstream wanna understand the protein level effects as well. So that's our software. And um, the next step to answering this question would be really to uh, screen these in a relevant cell model. So in summary today, uh, La Jolla Labs aims to democratize the drug discovery process as our, our big goal as a company. Our platform includes our AI and machine learning driven ASO design models and our HTS.bio software. We believe that the steric blocking strategies for ASO therapeutics have untapped potential. So that's really where we're focusing. And our partnerships um, help to improve the speed, accessibility, and costs of RNA targeting drug discovery. And finally, all the data from our screens do feed back into our ASO design models. Thus, we're hoping to continually improve uh, their, de their development as we conduct more and more screens going forward. So I'd like to say thank you for listening and I'll leave you with our vision statement and I'd be happy to take any questions.